heaven belongs to you. Oh, heaven belongs to you. Praise the Lord, greetings and welcome. My name is Sister Judy Groover and I bring you all the love that I have. I'm giving it to you from 3641 Georgia Avenue, Northwest Washington, DC. Thank you, thank you for being with us on this morning. And while we wait just a few more seconds, hit share, go on and hit share and invite someone else to this Sunday morning worship experience. And while we wait just a little bit longer, if you just joined us um, in the comment section below, put your name and where you're from. Thank you, thank you for being with us. And let's celebrate the Lord together on this morning. Amen. Well, God bless you this morning. We thank God for you joining us here at Fisherman of Men Church. We thank God for you joining this broadcast. We thank God for your fellowship. We thank God for your commitment to serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and propagating the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for every prayer that has gone forward for this broadcast to happen on today in Jesus' name. Go with me real quickly to the book of Titus, the second chapter, Titus chapter two, in the name of Jesus Christ. And we're going to read on this morning from verses 11 through 14. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. The Bible reads to us on today, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. His word is already blessed and we pray <clears throat> that you are a faithful reader of the word of God on today. We're going to ask you now if that if you have any prayer requests that you would make them known right now in the name of Jesus as we prepare to continue to set this atmosphere for the word of God and for a move of God in Jesus name. Submit your prayer requests now, make them known unto the Lord. Place your tears in God's hands on this morning. Ask God for a warm embrace, ask him to comfort you. God is a compassionate God, he's a loving God and he's here to be uh, as attentive as he can be. He's just waiting on you to call his name. As we go forward to our Lord and Savior on this morning in Jesus name. Father, we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for the gift of life. We thank you, God, for the breath of life on this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pull on your heart on today with the thanks praise, Lord, because you've done so much in our days past and in our weeks past, Lord, and you've kept us, Father God, when we didn't want to be kept. And Jesus, you've been very, very good to us, and we don't have enough tongues to tell you thank you. But if you would just hear this one thanks praise that we have for you on this morning, we pray that it would resonate in your heart and ring loudly in your ears, Jesus, about how grateful we are unto you. We ask of you this morning, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would bestow your presence among us, Father God. Be in the midst of us in this fellowship. And Lord, turn your attention to every prayer request that has been laid out before you on this morning in Jesus' name. We pray, God, that you would touch these prayer requests as you see fit, Lord. It may not align, Father God, with what we want to do, but God, you know what's good for us. And so we pray right now, Lord, that you would be meticulous enough to attend to everyone's need, every request, Father God, open your arms and Lord, and extend and embrace to those that need your hug on today. Extend compassion to someone that needs to hear from you, Lord. Extend, Father God, who you are, your hand, your feet, your voice, however you decide to do it, Lord. We'd be so grateful, Lord, and we promise to give your name the praise that you deserve. We ask of you also this morning in the name of Jesus, Lord, and then as much as we are petitioning you, that you would be the one to forgive us of our sins. God, we have come up short before you for far too many days, and we are asking in a manner of repentance, Lord, being kingdom-minded because we don't want to miss out on dwelling with you eternally. Father God, that you, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, would forgive our sins. 
We repent before you right now for every shortcoming. We repent before you, Father God, for everything that has been done that have brought you no glory. And Lord, we ask right now that if there are any grudges in your heart, in the hearts of your people, that you would bring it to our remembrance, Lord, so that our prayers may not be hindered. Cleanse us, Father God. Allow us to be acknowledged and accountable of these things that we have held in our heart for far too long. Show us the way, Jesus, and direct us according to your word and according to your spirit that we may know that this is the way that we are supposed to go. Show yourself strong, Father God, as you have said in your word that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And we endeavor on today, Father God, to walk in stride with you. We praise you and we thank you right now for this moment and this time is unto you for your glory, for your honor, and for your worship. We love you and we thank you so much. And we pray this prayer now in Jesus' name. Let everyone that loves the Lord say amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. My name is Anthony Whittington. I'm an ordained deacon at the Refuge Church of Christ in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As we used to say a long time ago, where the feast of the Lord is going on. I'm happy to have salvation on the inside. And it gives me great pleasure to be able to speak to you all concerning my relationship with Fisher Man of Men, and in particular with Clarence Groover. The t-shirt I'm adorning is more than just merchandising to me because Clarence was my friend. And from time to time, I find that I miss him. I miss my relationship with the Groovers in general because it was one where after service, we could sit around at dinner and just talk friend to friend. Sometimes it was father to son, other times it was just me and my friend having a good time, talking of the goodness of God and explaining to each other the roads that we took, the perils that we faced, and how from time to time, it's always good to have real and true friends. I'm happy also that the Groovers were able to take in my daughter, Natisse Whittington, Dr. Natisse Whittington, as one of their own. She has flourished there in Washington, D.C., and it's considered that refuge is still somehow in there. We're going to try to hold on to her, but she truly is a member of Fisherman of Men, and I couldn't think of a better place for her to have fellowship, in particular with the Groovers, with Judy. Uh, with Mother and with all of the saints there at Fisherman. So without further ado, I'd like to go into my personal testimony, which I'm glad to offer because if you take nothing away from this video other than this, God is good and the Lord is truly blessed. Deacon Whittington, God bless you all. I'm happy to be able to give my testimony to you here and for the brief time that we fellowship, though it be electronic because of the perils of COVID, because of you know, the, just the overall direction that the world is heading in, it's good to know that you have a comfort and an answer beyond the grave. I am suffering with cancer. It's something that's been my ordeal for a few years now. And the thing that uh, primarily has been the driving force in my life is a phrase that I've come up with in my approach to dealing with this. Yes, I have cancer, but cancer doesn't have me. God has me. And God has always had the final say in everything in my life, every walk I've ever taken, every uh, situation that I've ever faced. God's handprint has always been there leading me protecting me, advising me, and above all else, keeping me safe and keeping me saved. In this perilous time, you need an answer. In this perilous time, you need an anchor. And my anchor holds and grips the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And again, I am so happy that Clarence Groover was my friend. I miss him so much sometimes uh, because he truly was an honest man of God, and a fisher man of men. Bishop Groover was instrumental in getting my perspective, uh, long-term wise, on a lot of things to be rooted and grounded. He shared a story with me of a person that asked him, how can you always be in church, just church, church, church? And Bishop didn't hesitate. He said, the Lord has pleasures in his right hand. 
or in his left hand and pleasures forevermore in his right hand. Why would you not want to be with someone who wants to satisfy your every need, period? Throughout eternity, God will always be there and he will always be there for you. When I thought about what I would like to say to the general public and to impart to anyone that might see this and find themselves facing a death sentence, because that's what cancer uh, truly is. I will say this frankly to you all. My cancer care team has said to me, at this point, Mr. Whittington, we can situate you in hospice and keep you comfortable. I don't look like I need to be in hospice and my attitude is not one of that I just will be there. The doctor said, you know, we'll keep you as comfortable as we can and let nature take its course. But what is nature? It's man's relationship with God that has been skewed by flesh, by our carnal desire to actually want something now. And through it all, even in the times where it's been very difficult for me to deal with, the pain being so excruciating, God has said to me, Anthony, you have to trust me. And if it was because of coming to this very point in time, for such a time as this, then I understand why God has allowed me to suffer. The one thing that is profound in all of this is the one part that I would like to share with you all. I found myself back in the hospital, flat out on my back, and just unable to digest my food. They actually had to snake a tube uh, down my nose and into my stomach to empty out uh, the food that was in my stomach. The particular type of cancer I have uh, attacks my bile duct and I could not pass a stool uh, that night. The doctors gathered in the room and they had my family on a conference call and saying to them that the only alternative, and again, this is man speaking, the only alternative was for them to cut a hole, literally cut a hole in the side of my stomach and put a plug there, I would eat. And then after a amount of time would pass, I would pull the plug out and allow, you know, what's left to drain because of the blockage. And again, they were preparing me. I was prepped that night and that next morning I would have to go in and have this surgery. My family understood uh, what was what and they said it was up to me, which I expected them uh, to say. I tell you, saints, I looked those doctors in the eye and I said to them, God has the final say. Some of them understood it. A lot of them, I don't know that they ever will, but that is not my part and parcel. That is not the path I've chosen. I believe God and I believed God that night. In the morning, I woke out of a dead sleep and I knew, you know, that I was fine. Not only did the blockage <laughs> just go away, I had a fairly large bowel movement that morning and I, <laughs> I'm sitting in the bathroom crying because God is good. Not crying out of frustration, not crying because you know, I felt there was no hope, crying because God is good. And God is good in a way that will blow your mind. He's waiting to be as intimate with you as you will allow him to be. And he's always there for you. It might seem like that entity, that being, is always this far off, you know, mystical, magical thing. And that's not what God is. God is your friend. God is your help. And he's your hope. My help through that night was prayer and the prayer of my family the prayers of Bishop Groover before he passed, and the prayers of everyone that knows me helped me through that night. And for that blockage to just go away is nothing less than a miracle, and I'm happy to be able to testify to you all. I don't look like I have cancer other than the thinness of my frame. Um, here I am when I was fat, you know, when I was bulky as 200 pounds. <laughs> Last I looked on the scale, I weighed 139 pounds. And it's just the physical house that I'm stuck in right now that has to wear away from this attack of cancer. My spirit rests in God, and my hope is beyond the grave. I'm always going to have an answer. 
I'm always going to know that Jesus is the answer to any circumstance you have, to any situation that you'll face, if you believe, if you trust, and if, over time, you have a relationship with Him where you can say, Lord, I need to hear from you. I'll segue a little on that because there is that very scripture that says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. I was in the intensive care unit the night before, again. Uh, God miraculously cleared up a severe asthma attack I had. And they made me stay for four hours to make sure I, what they call a bounce wouldn't occur to where I would have that attack come back upon me. But when I got home uh, that Friday morning, I said, I've got to go to church. I didn't feel like it. I didn't you know I was miserable, but there was a Friday night service. And I went, I took my wife and we went and I said, Lord, I need to hear from you. I opened up a little pocket Bible, my grandson's a Bible that he carries around to that very scripture. And I read, godliness with contentment is great gain. I said, thank you, Lord. I closed up the Bible and I went into fellowship. And I don't want to say halfway in, but in on to uh, Elder McCray's service or his sermon. He actually said, godliness with contentment is great gain. It's one thing to know the rote and repetition of a Christian life. It's a completely other thing to actually stare death in the face and not be afraid to actually come to a conclusion of hearing someone tell you, you are going to die and not be scared, not be bothered by it. It doesn't frighten me because I prepared for that very circumstance. I put my house in order. I believe God. I've taught my children to follow Jesus, not follow dad, not follow you know, even religious figures to a point. In holiness, we follow the pastor, period. If he's wrong, God will deal with him. But you as a part of the congregation need to know who's in charge and who the head is. And we follow by the scriptures. We live by the scriptures. And it's the scriptures that give us life and happiness and hope beyond the grave. And so back to my testimony, when I knew that that blockage was cleared, I called the doctors and they canceled the surgery, um, but they didn't say anything else to me. They began to monitor me to see uh, how well I could do uh, with solid foods. I didn't take anything in solid for a long time. And since you know, having to uh, subsist on tomato soup and that sort of thing, I've had more tomato soup than one person should have to eat in their lifetime. Uh, but just tonight, I had a very good meal of roasted chicken, uh, macaroni, and uh, spinach, uh, and I had cornbread. I had a regular full meal, and I'm not worried about, you know, having to rush to the hospital because I can't pass my uh, bowels because God is good and because I know him for myself. That is my testimony, and I encourage all of you who hear this, all of you who might come across this in your walk uh, of faith, to try Jesus. Take him at his word and believe him that he is going to do it. It's, it's up to you. It really is. Uh, the final word is up to you. The final say is God's. Either you believe him or you don't. Either you seek after him or you don't. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And as for my personal position, I have a shirt to remind me of my friend. I have my family to remind me of my belief. And I have faith in God to remind me that eternity is one breath away and my circumstance shouldn't alarm me and shouldn't trouble me to the point where I worry. I don't have to worry. I don't have to fret. 
I believe God. You should also. Bye, everybody. Thank you for this time and space. Again, my name is Deacon Anthony Whittington of the Refuge Church of Christ, and it affords me the greatest of pleasure to be able to speak to you all here of my testimony. I have cancer. Cancer does not have me. God bless you all. Praise the Lord, everybody. Truly, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings from Fishermen of Men Church. My name is Angelica Hamilton. I'm here to give you a few announcements. First, you can continue to worship with us each Sunday morning during this quarantine time at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can worship with us live from Facebook, from our website, which is fishermenofmenchurch.org, or from Instagram, and also on YouTube. Secondly, you can worship with us each Sunday evening at 11.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll be streaming live from myspiritdc.com, or you can download our church podcast. Lastly, please continue to participate in weekly online giving. There are three ways to virtually give. You can give via our cash app, which is the dollar sign FOM3641, or you can give on our website, which is again, fishermenofmenchurch.org, or you can text the word give to 301-709-7233. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning and may God continue to bless you. Welcome, welcome and greetings. My name is Sister Judy Groover. If you just joined us, thank you for being a part. 2020 means so many things for so many different people. But 2020, what it means for the Fisherman and family is our golden jubilee. 50 years, 50 years of prayer and fasting. Thank you, Bishop Clarence Gruber, for starting this vision, believing in God and trusting in him. Also, Mother Nettie Gruber for standing right beside him and lifting him up in prayer. And his children who went home to be with the Lord. Sonia Anita Clarence Jr., also, Roy Russell, the fourth, and the entire Fisherman and Men family, our faithful radio listeners that have been with us for over 40 years, and now our online viewers, our visitors, saints, and friends, our neighbors. Happy anniversary, Fisherman and Men Church family. Jesus, share for me. Way back on Calvary, I know the blood that gives me strength from day. Blood 
that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose. It will never lose. It will never lose. together. Praise the Lord. Saints, friends, hallelujah, brethren, to everybody. We love the Lord today. and We magnify his name because he is a good God. And I'm feeling mighty good. I'm feeling mighty good. I'm feeling mighty good right now because the Lord is my strength. Praise him. The blood. Jesus shed his blood. The only begotten Son for us. Hallelujah. Oh my God. It reaches to the highest mountain. And it flows to the lowest valley. The blood. It will never lose its power. We are encouraged today. I am encouraged. This I am encouraged. Hallelujah. And I want you to be encouraged. Because what we are going through, we're going through together. This thing, we've never experienced anything like this. But God is our captain. He knows. He knows what he's doing. He's in control. And we love him. I thank him that I ran under that blood. Got under that blood. Hallelujah. And I'm still under the blood. The blood is real. Hallelujah. I praise God for the Holy Ghost. And I praise him for the water baptism. I praise him because God is in control. Be encouraged. You encourage me by keep, hallelujah, listening and viewing. And I hope that I have said a word to encourage you today in Jesus. Don't forget the blood. In Jesus' name, amen.
Welcome, welcome. My name is Sister Judy Groover. And if you just tuned in or you've been with us since 11, we are about to receive the word of God. Let's open our hearts and our minds and let's hear what thus saith the Lord. Amen. Go with me this morning to the book of James, the book of James, the first chapter. And we're going to read this morning from verses 14 and verses 15. James chapter one, verses 14 and 15. The Bible reads to us on today, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Bow your heads with me in a word of prayer as we prepare to go forward delivering and, and expressing that which God has given on today in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, for this hour. We thank you, God, for this day. And we pray right now, Lord, that your people have been made ready to receive what thus saith the Lord. We ask of you, God, that you would continue to pour into us, Father God, your empty receptacles on today, that we may receive the abundance of who you are. Surely a droplet of anointing from you would be more than enough to sustain us for the rest of our life. Father, we pray right now that in as much as you have made your people ready, I pray that I am your manservant, that I am ready to speak what thus saith the Lord on today. I'm available unto you, God. Use me for your glory, for this is not for any glory unto me, but to lift up the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am here empty and inadequate. I cannot articulate the words of love, life and liberty unless you first speak through me. Use me, Father God. For your glory, we pray this prayer now in Jesus' name, amen. We titled this sermon on today, The Life Cycle. We titled this sermon on today, The Life Cycle. And when we're dealing with this particular passage of scripture or this subject matter, if you will, dealing with life, we're talking about life from a very reproductive perspective or the product or that which is produced in Jesus' name. Life then, if we're looking at it from a dictionary standpoint, is, is given to us to speak to us from the perspective that it's animated, it is an animated existence of an individual. So life then means that we are alive or whatever has life is alive, is living in the abundance of our society, is able to move and to exist, um, and, and it's able uh, to it, it's able to be uh, validated as part of who we are or part of where we are. And so when we think about being alive, life takes us through a number of different challenges and a number of different emotions a lot of times, but life in, in being alive means that we simply inhale and exhale breath, air, oxygen, that which God first breathed into the lungs of Adam. Life is expressive in so many ways. Life is emotional in so many ways. Life brings us many challenges. It brings us uh, many different situations. Life brings us many circumstances. Life is just that. It's to be lived. How you live it is where the question is. What you produce in life is where the problem is. And so when we're dealing with this passage of scripture in the book of James, the first chapter in Jesus' name. The Bible talks to us about the temptation, and the Bible does not limit this to just say uh, some men or some women, but the Bible says to us very clearly in verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. What the Bible is simply expressing to us is that in as much as we want to blame someone else for our shortcomings, it's not our, it's not someone else's fault that we have come up short. Our temptations or the things that have tempted us is what caused us to be drawn away. But it's our own lust that allowed us to attach to that temptation. It's, it's that which we've been pondering. It's that which we've been entertaining ourselves with uh, from a physical perspective, from a visual perspective, and from an audio, audible perspective in Jesus' name. And so we have to be careful about how much we allow into these spe specific gates of our life, our ear gates, our, 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 our eye gates. We got to be careful about what we allow into 
our spirits so that we're able then to manage uh, the temptations that come to us by partaking in too much it is an overconsumption. And so an overconsumption would then mean that we have filled ourselves with more than what we need. And so therefore we delve then into that fleshly aspect of who we are that never seems to be satisfied. I don't know about you, but I'll be honest with you. My flesh sometimes can't seem to get enough, whether I'm doing right or whether I'm doing wrong. I often think about the the Romans 7, the Paul in Romans 7, in which he thoroughly expresses to us his shortcomings, his struggle. And as he begins to conclude that particular passage of that particular chapter, he says to us, oh, wretched man that I am. And he is, seems like he has had enough of who he is. He has had enough of his shortcomings. He has had enough of his failures. And so when we're dealing with life on this morning, life will be a presentation to us oftentimes uh, a reflection moment in which we have had enough of who we are. We've had enough of our worldly temptations. We've had enough of our own lust. We've had enough of being enticed. We've had enough of actually falling short and giving in to these lusts and giving in to these temptations. You have to say to yourself at some point in his life, especially a life that's walking with Jesus Christ and that has considered him as your Lord and Savior, being baptized in his name and prayerfully filled with the Holy Ghost, you have to say to yourself, enough is enough. You have to come to the end of yourself. You have to get tired of who you are because who you are, I mean, in its purest form is not perfect. The Bible says we are shaping, we are, we are born in sin and shaping in iniquity. So we are born into a atmosphere that is sinful, that is full of fleshly ideas, full of fleshly agendas, full of fleshly motivations, full of fleshly temptations. But we're shaping in iniquity. We are shaping in such a fashion that these are the things that we should do. We should we shouldn't do the things that concern God. We shouldn't do the things that that bring God glory. We shouldn't do the things that that magnify the Lord. But we should do everything that the world is doing only to bring ourselves to an end that we'll, we won't be satisfied with eternally speaking. And so when we move on in this particular passage of scripture, we move on to begin to talk about verse 15. Verse 15 expresses to us on this morning, it gives us a process, a life process. It, it talks to us and, and it talks to us from, from conception to death. I don't know about you, but that is life within itself. How does life come about? How does, how does life present itself? Well, life often starts not just from lust, but if we think about it from the biblical standpoint, life started from love. When God considered you and God considered me, he considered us in love. He loved the thought. He loved the idea. He loved the expression of himself through you. He loved how he has created you. He loves who you are. God does not like everything that you do. So let's draw a dividing line here. But he loves who you are and, and how he created you. He's not so much in love with you that he's going to fool himself. But he is so much in love with you that he will create a covering to be able to see you in your purest form. Thank God for the blood. And through that blood, Jesus is able to see you and to receive you even in the midst of your wrongdoings. God and sin cannot coexist. So we need a filter so that we're able to be in his presence. And so when we're dealing with love on this morning, love, love, God speaks to us about love in so many ways. But I just want to bring to your attention on today, if you can just go with me to the book of First Corinthians, the 13th chapter. And real briefly, I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says about love beginning in verse four. It's, it, 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 it uses the word charity for love. And it says, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. As the Bible expresses love to us on today, I'm telling you, I can see Jesus so well manifested in verse four. I can see Jesus just wrapped up in all of that. Jesus was one who, who when he walked the earth, he, he made of himself no reputation. And honestly, there's no need to make him make, make a reputation of himself when everyone's talking so well about you. 
You don't have to pat yourself on the back if you are doing the right things for everyone to be able to speak well of you. But it's when you are not doing what God has called you to do. No one is speaking well of you and you're feeling like you have to draw attention to yourself. That's not love. That's not love for your man, your fellow man or your fellow woman. That's also not love for yourself. Love is, as, it, as it's been expressed here, is not puffed up. It's not vain. It's, it's, not, it's not so wrapped up in itself that it does not consider the next person. And so when we put that into perspective and consider Jesus Christ, it was him that died on the cross on behalf of you and me. It was him that considered you and me as he hung there, as he did not let the centurion, the Roman soldiers kill him, but he gave up his own life. In that alone, just that word give is enough to let us know that Jesus was extremely sacrificial, but also considerate and absolutely in love with who we are. He does not want us to live a life eternally without him. And so therefore he died to make a way possible for us to dwell with him eternally and worship him at his feet. What a beautiful savior we serve on today in Jesus name. Love should be the producer of life. Love should be the very thing that causes two people, man and woman, to come together uh, under the eyes of God, to be married according to the word of God, and to live according to the word of God, and produce that expression of love, which is a child. Love then would be the thing that causes the home to grow in a manner that God can be pleased with, a home to be expressive about how they feel, whether it be in good times or in bad times, to not make assumptions, to not be so emotionally driven that everything that is said is offensive. That's not love. Love should be a, a presentation of kind words, but very to the point. Oftentimes words are said to be cutting and, and daggers to the heart. Love should not bring about so much pain uh, in, 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 in as much as it is a sharing moment, love will only bring pain when someone's life seemingly comes to a close. Love shouldn't be so painful that you don't desire to live. You should desire to live now and live eternally. The Bible makes it simple when it says that God is love. So when we think about love, we have to include God in that. They are one and the same. Love is God and God is love. So when you're truly expressing the fullness of what love is, you are expressing the very nature of who God is in Jesus name. And so because love is a producer or a reproducer, we consider verse 15 on today when the Bible speaks to us and it says to us, then when lust hath conceived, the problem that I have with verse 15 on this morning is that it's not talking to us about love. It's talking to us about lust. And, and, and lust is, is, a, is a fleshly move. It is, it, it is very full of ourselves and is often extremely deceitful. And so in as much as we think we're getting away with something in that moment, we're deceiving ourselves. But truly in this life and as much as we're trying to get away with things that do not please God, we are deceiving other people as well in our discreet, deceptive actions. Love, however, does not choose to hide. Love is right out front. Love is for the fellow man. Love is for everyone. But when lust begins to take hold, we cannot exchange lust for love and love for lust. You can have a lustful moment while in love and being entangled or married to the right person. But what you cannot have is lust and that be a producer of love. The Bible does not express it to us this way. The Bible says, lust, then when lust hath conceived. I want to pause there for a minute because love is usually the language or the emotion by which two people come together for conception. However, what we see here is we see that there's a, there's a world that we live in that is absolutely full of lust. We have found this in the Bible time in and time out. And so when lust presents itself to us on this morning, it says to us that when lust has conceived, meaning lust has reproduced something, lust, lust has come together. And that could be two people very caught up in their flesh, very distraught in their emotions, very torn as it relates to their relationship with Christ and very drawn away from what God has called. But when it has conceived, it says to us on this morning that it bringeth forth sin. Lust bringeth forth sin. The byproduct or the reproduction or that which lust has produced is sin. 
The baby of lust is sin. The child, that which you carry around is sin. Lust does not produce life, but this is a life cycle. Meaning where does sin come from? Sin presented itself in the, in the form of lust. It, lust conceived it, lust birthed it, and now we have sin. We have the presentation of sin. We have the life we live that is often filled with sin. We have Jesus that died on the cross for sin. He is dying to kill something or to keep us from something or to cover us so that he can see us in the right way because our world is so full of sin. It bringeth forth sin. I'm carrying the baby. And this baby is called sin. This baby is the byproduct of what lust is, not love. Love does not give us or produce sin. Love produces life. Sin, however, is not life. Sin becomes the birth. Now, oftentimes when we think about birth, we think about it from a labor standpoint, pain, and that which you had to endure, not enjoyable. If I may pause here for a minute, if we're dealing with lust and we're dealing with sin, I can't imagine dealing with pain. I haven't always been saved. And so because I have not always been saved, I fully understand that in dealing with lust and dealing with sin, those are, mo those are moments that are often enjoyable. I don't count the negative impact of my actions. I don't count uh, the, the wrongdoings that I'm doing. I just enjoy the moment. And so when we're bringing forth lust and dealing with it from a sinful standpoint or the birth or the life that sin or the life that lust has produced, which is sin itself, then what we're saying here is that we have not endured any labor pains. The value, the appreciation uh, of, of, of what we should have for life is not there. We don't value life. We take it for granted. But when you endure labor pains, when you're having to work hard to produce that life out of love, you're grateful for that which God has given you. Your care and concern for it, the level of detail, the level of attention that you get is far different than you would to something that you lusted over. You're there for a minute and gone the next minute. That's what lust is. But what you produced in that moment is sin. It's the baby that you carry now. You're carrying this sin everywhere that you go. The Bible says to us in the book of Psalm, the 51st chapter and the fifth verse, it says, as I've already stated, behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. As we move on in this passage of scripture and consider lust and consider the child that has been born from lust and sin, the Bible says to us, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. When it's talking about sin, when it's being finished, it's also talking about a past life that has been lived. A life that has been lived in sin, a life that has been enveloped in sin, a life that has failed to acknowledge God, a life that has failed to keep God in his right perspective, a life that has not been filled with prayer, a life that has not submitted itself to the power or the word of God, a life that, that has prayed to God on occasion, called out the name of Jesus on occasion, but lived a life of sin, lived the life of lust. Live the life filled with carrying this sin baby and producing and reproducing this sin baby over and over again. Sin has found a host to live inside. If I may for a minute parallel sin to cancer. I don't want to be offensive or insensitive to anybody's life or situation that you may be going through. But cancer finds a way to attach itself to the insides of who you are. Cancer finds a way to nourish itself. Cancer finds something to attach itself to so that it may grow. What happens oftentimes when the doctors are unsuccessful and medicine seems to fail is that cancer grows, but it grows so much so that it consumes the person. It consumes the very being that you are and you physically begin to change. The changes, however, manifest themselves internally before they manifest themselves externally. And so the external presentation of sin or the cancer growing in your life is a person you can no longer resemble. The countenance has changed, the glow has changed, the joy is gone, there is no more peace, frustration is at an all time high, and sadness has found its way into a life that was once promised, that was once filled with hope, that once had a bright future, that once had purpose that God has called him to. And so when we're dealing with the cancer of sin or the growth of, of sin in us, 
We're dealing with something that is absolutely eating away at the internals of us as people, eating us so much away that we can't think the way God has called us to think. And we have lost all hope because of the diagnosis of the doctor, because of your medical condition. Your hope is gone. But also because of the lifestyle and the baby that you created in sin, you have no hope. Today, I'm going to tell you that this life cycle is not a life that's reproducing life. This is the life cycle then that's reproducing death over and over again. Our society has, has become more consumed with the things of this world, the mindsets of the people, the fleshly uh, expressions of who we are. I mean, it's, 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 it's such a divide happening in our society today that sin is running rapid. Lust is filling the air. Lust is often accompanied with uh, desire. Desire then brings about things that we want and things that we want to do. And so when we're thinking about it as, as sin lives and sin, as the Bible says, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. What the Bible says to us in Romans, the sixth chapter and the 23rd verse, it says to us very clearly, for the wages of sin is death, uh, that which you have earned when we think about wages. Look at your pay stub when we're dealing with wages. Wages is that which you have earned, that which you have signed up for, your awful letter you got from the job that just that, that you just interviewed for. They gave you a salary or stated what your hourly wage was going to be. You're earning that money. And so you have earned death in the wages that you have sold or earned in sin. But it goes on to say in Romans 6 and 23, so that we don't have this despair moment or this moment of hopelessness. It goes on to let us know that there is a light and there is a window, but more importantly, there is a God. And it says to us, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The gift of God is, 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 is that which he has already done for us to make himself available. The gift of God is, is allowing us to, to dwell in this time under the grace and in, in the dispensation of grace. The gift of, the gift of God is the bed. The veil being torn from top to bottom and, and making it available for us to, to speak to our Lord and Savior and to get down on bended knee. The gift of God is, is the, the ability to exhale and to inhale in this moment and just thank and praise him for who he is. The gift of God is having a right to eternal life in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of how we feel. The gift of God is, 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 is drawing us closer day after day and, and having the ability to seek God while he still may be found. The gift of God is drawing nigh unto the Lord and, 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 and saying, God, this is what you said in your word and that he will draw nigh unto you. This is a gift of God. This is life. God says in his word that, that he wants us to have life and, and, and that more abundantly. That's what he said in his word, life more abundantly, meaning whatever you're living right now is only a scratch of the surface for what God has called you to. And it does not have to be in the fullness, in his fullness presentation of that which he has called you to while you're here on earth. But when you get to heaven, my God, I praise you right now. God says in his word that he has rooms in his house and those rooms are the size of mansions. This is not a materialistic message by no means. But what I am saying to you is that those things, those temporary things that you desired after or sought after while you're here on earth, God has them so much more in abundance in heaven. And so our focus on today as we deal with the life cycle is to understand the nature of sin and the body by which sin brings itself or presents itself to us in lust. And the reproduction of lust is the sin that we live. But this sin then finds its way to live on the inside of us and grow to consume the very person that we are. It stops us from eating. It stops us from thinking. It stops us from living. As the Bible concludes in verse 15, it says to us very clearly on today in Jesus name, it talks to us and it says, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Listen, I'm talking very personal to you right now because I want you to understand death is no easy thing. Whether we're in it from a preaching standpoint, delivering a eulogy, from a funeral director standpoint, or whether we're in it from a family standpoint, celebrating our loved one that's in a casket. Death is no easy thing. But now to be the one laying in the casket and not having given yourself to Jesus Christ. Ignoring the fact that his, his, his time draws nigh. The times of today, our society 
has expressed to us and has let us know that the people are drawing further and further apart. And it is truly time to draw closer to God. The life cycle comes to us today to let us know that at the conclusion of life or a life lived in sin, you get that which you earn as expressed in Romans 6 and 23. It's wages, you earn that. But God has come to give us the gift of eternal life. And so the life cycle presents to us today, what life do you choose? Or better said, do you choose life or do you, do you choose death? I want to express to you real quickly from the book of Jeremiah 29 and 11. And I pray that you wrote these passages of scripture down. It says real clearly about the mind of God and how he thinks of us. It talks to us this morning and it says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Where God wants to bring you to will not be expected by family, but it will be expected by him. What God wants to bring you to will be far greater than that which you could have ever imagined. But saints of God, those that love the Lord, those that are coming to know the Lord, and those that don't yet know him and love him for who he is, I express to you on today this message. As we deal with the life cycle on today, the presentation of sin and how it has birthed and, con and was conceived and how it has taken hold and lived on the inside of us, just know that God has already given us a remedy in the Holy Ghost. And if you decide to give your life unto the Lord on today and just ask God, Lord, fill me with your spirit. I firmly believe that in as much as God has done it for me, he will surely do it for you. This is the day, saints of God, that God has made, that the Lord has made. Which do you choose? Do you choose the life cycle that leads to death? Or do you choose the life cycle that leads to eternal life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Listen, now is a great time for you as you have fellowship with the Fisherman of Men Church and tuned into this broadcast on today. Now is a great time to support this ministry. The word of God has gone forward in the name of Jesus Christ. God has ministered. But we're looking for you. We're looking to you to be a supporter of this ministry. The church has three ways to give in Jesus' name. You can go online at www.fishermanofmenchurch.org. You can cash out and you can also text an offering or a donation to the church. Listen, remember your donations to the church, your donations to a charitable organization. You can write them off in your taxes. And so by giving to Fisherman of Men Church, not only are you supporting the ministry, but you're also worshiping God. God said in this word that he loves a cheerful giver, not a rich one, not one that's full of himself, but just a cheerful one. Someone who's excited about who God is, about the work of God, about the move of God and wants to give. He says he loves a cheerful giver. Do you love him enough to give on today? Do you love him enough to support this ministry? Do you love him enough so that the word of God, life, can continue to go forward in Jesus' name? Support this life cycle. Support the eternal life. Support the drive, the ambition, the hunger for life eternal. Support that on today. Support the word of God going forward. And I promise you that the same way God did it for me, when I began to release everything I had to him, God will bless you beyond measure. If he did it for me, surely he will do it for you. God bless you all. We thank God for you on today in Jesus' name. We thank God for the life cycle. Study your word. Get before God. Desire life eternal. Love on Jesus and worship him for the beautiful Savior that he is. You've been with us the whole hour. Thank you for being with us. And we would love for you to come back but bring someone with you next Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We thank God for just allowing us to have this opportunity to worship together. And again, this week, we would love for you to show love. Show love to everyone. Show love to those who you haven't been showing total love to, partial love. We want you to take it to a whole nother level. Brotherly love is more than a motto. And in the comment section below, please um, type in hashtag 
brotherly love. Hashtag brotherly love. I love you so much.